and welcome to this video on practical and analytical techniques. Uh, this is for OCRB Salters, what's in a medicine topic. My name is Chris Harris and I'm from allerytutors.com and in this video we're basically going to go through this topic as a revision source. Um, so basically it's going to give you an overview of, um, of this topic and make sure that you know um, the type of things you could be expected to be questioned on in your exam. Um, obviously it's, it's purely there just for content basis but you need to be practicing as well your exam technique through um, through um, answering obviously questions in an exam paper and there's some of them on my channel as well so uh, fill your boots basically it's all there um, yeah the slides that I'm using here um, that you can they are available to purchase if you just click on the link in the description box you can get a hold of them there great to enhance your revision and um, you have your own copy um, and uh, basically you can um, um, you can use them to obviously put your tablet on your phone um, they're really great value for money. So just, just go and have a look there and, and go and see um, what's available. And the whole series is there, by the way, for AS, the whole thing. Um, right, okay, so what does the spec say? So this basically uh, is telling us that anything that's in this uh, in this video um, is actually uh, linked to the Salters B course, so which is uh, OCRB, sorry, which is Salters. So if you're doing that, then this should match it. So that's great. Okay, let's have a look at uh, reflux. So reflux is a technique uh, when you want to heat volatile liquids. Okay, so you can see the diagram there set up showing a reflux setup. Now reflux allows strong heating of without losing these volatile compounds. So instead of just heating them in a beaker where you'll lose them to the atmosphere, uh, with these ones actually you just put them in the condenser. So what they do is they evaporate and they condense against the condenser which has got water going in, cold water going in and cold water going out the top and your gases will go through this inner tube here, condense and then drip back down so you don't lose any. Now the library condenser, like I say, has cold water running through it, hot evaporating substances, they cool and condense and they go back into that round bottom flask where they react further. Now because we're using flammable liquids, generally because this is organic chemistry, um, a lot of organic compounds are flammable, um, so we heat under a water bath, we don't really heat with the direct flame for that reason so we can use a, uh, either do this indirectly or we can use an electric heating mantle uh, which is just an electric heater basically and it warms up your compound but again you don't have a naked flame right near this okay distillation this is used when you want to separate substances with different boiling points you can see our distillation kit there now all we're doing is we're gently heating our mixture and you will get and it has to be gentle we're not heating it like full belt because we want to heat it to a very specific boiling point uh, and they do separate in order of boiling points the lowest boiling point will evaporate first then your next one then your next one etc so knowing that boiling point of the chemical you want to separate will allow you to decide uh, what temperature actually you're going to heat this to uh, and this means that if you know the boiling point of the substance you want you just heat to that boiling point and you know that any gases coming off at that boiling point will be because of the product that you want now, if your compound is the lower boiling point than your start mixture, uh, you basically heat to that temperature and the boiling point of your compound that you want to separate, and you collect it in the flask separate at the other end of the condenser. But if the boiling point is a higher boiling point than your start mixture, you'll actually found your you find your substance in here. So what you're doing is you boil to the um, um, you boil to just below the boiling point that you want to that you want to um, uh, separate and basically all the other boiling points of the impurities will run out into here and you'll be left with the compound that you want in here. Now distillation is really useful if you want to um, extract a chemical before it reacts any further so for example with primary alcohols when you oxidize primary alcohols uh, they oxidize to an aldehyde first then to a carboxylic acid but if you just want the aldehyde you have to use distillation to get that aldehyde first if you don't use distillation, it'll just re-react further and oxidize further to carboxylic acid. So actually distillation is really useful for that in particular. Okay, redistillation uh, is basically when you want to purify a volatile substance um, and it can be purified further, again, using something called separation. So what we need to do is once we've distilled it first, we get our product, but our product still has impurities in, so we can distill it again. Um, and basically we're just separating our useful organic substance that we want from the impurities and obviously this redistillation can help um, and obviously we're separating it by boiling point we collect the different substances by monitoring the temperature 
of which they boil at and collecting the different liquids as they come out the condenser. So it's just making sure that, again, you are keeping an eye on what boiling point it is, what temperature it is on here, and the boiling point of the substance you do want, and basically you're just redistilling it, basically trying to purify it again. Now, obviously, despite distillation, we still have some impurities in there on redistillation, should I say, as well. Uh, basically, we need further separation and purification. Uh, we use this, obviously, a separating funnel, and um, we had a drying agent as well afterwards. But let's go and have a look now and see um, actually how we do this. Okay, basically the separation technique that we just briefly looked at just before is basically to remove impurities that are dissolved in the water. Okay, so the first thing we have to do for separation is um, from the distillation or the redistillation that we've just done, we add that substance into the um, separating funnel, as you can see here, and that's obviously clamped to a, a, a clamp stand we add water and uh, what the water does it helps to dissolve some of them soluble impurities uh, and it creates this aqueous solution full of these soluble impurities in there now after allowing this solution to settle we get two layers forming now the top layer has got our impure product again we have purified it and it is getting better we are purifying it um, all the time but we still do have some impurities in there the bottom layer has got this aqueous layer containing some of them soluble impurities the water soluble impurities and all we're going to do is going to drain this aqueous layer off we don't want this aqueous layer and um, remember we have to remove that stopper as well if we keep that stopper on there it won't drain properly okay so make sure the stopper's off and then obviously you're wanting this layer here now purification, basically what we do is we take this impure um, substance here, this stuff here, in the separating funnel and we add this to a round bottomed flask. And then what we do is we add anhydrous calcium chloride to this uh, impure product here, our organic layer. And basically what it does is it removes any water that could still remain in this organic layer. And the anhydrous calcium chloride, you basically add, and it'll start to clump together if there's water present. And you keep on adding it until you get your calcium chloride kind of freely floating around. And that suggests that there isn't any more water to absorb, and you've, um, you've, you've extracted as much water as you can. Uh, invert that flask, just give it a good shake, make sure you've got all the water molecules out of there. And obviously, the final step is then filtering. Um, and all we do is we filter to try and remove that solid drying agent that we add. Um, we don't want that solid drying agent in there, um, and so obviously we've got to filter it. So let's have a look at filtration. So again, this is used to separate the solids from the liquids. Um, the best form of filtration is using um, vacuum filtration, uh, where we have a Buckner funnel, obviously, on the top here, uh, and that's obviously sealed off with a rubber bung, and that would go through the rubber bung, it's just to kind of show you how it fits. And we've got a vacuum here. Normally, you can just connect that straight to a vacuum equipment, or you can connect it to a tap, with a vacuum valve uh, attached to it, which creates the vacuum. Now, basically the vacuum is used to help separate the liquid and the solid uh, thoroughly. You want all the solid to be trapped in here and the liquid in here. Now, what, how we do this is we take these little paper discs, we sit it inside the Buckner funnel, we just wet it slightly just to make sure it's got a good seal around, uh, around there. Um, and then we pour the reaction mixture through the top of the funnel a uh, vacuum line is switched on and it'll draw the liquid through and leave your solid powder stuck in the top of the funnel. Now what it does is, as you, as you probably may, may know, is that it creates this reduced pressure. Obviously we're creating a vacuum in here, pulls the liquid through, the solid will be left in there. Um, you just got to make sure that um, you haven't damaged the filter paper on here, uh, otherwise you will get some of your solid uh, filtering through here. But it, it's pretty speedy, so it should be okay. Um, now, if you are wanting to keep the solid, and like the anhydrous solid that we had before, just to remove the water, we don't want to keep that, we just want this bit. But sometimes what we want to do is actually get the solid bit, uh, and we want to keep that solid uh, that we've just created. Now, if it's the solid we're after, then what we have to do is recrystallize that, and this is purification of a solid rather than purification of a liquid like we've seen before. So let's have a look. So recrystallization is really important. We've got to know how to actually purify our solid. And a lot of products that we do collect are solids. So recrystallization is a method to purify these solids. And the solvent that we choose is incredibly important, as you're going to see. So the first step we have to do is add just enough hot solvent to allow that impure solid 
to dissolve. Okay, that's the solid we've just got in that Buckner funnel. And um, what we'll have is a saturated solution of your impure product. Okay, it's incredibly saturated. It's got to be the minimum amount. Then what we do is just allow it just gently just to cool down slowly. And what you'll get is your crystals will start to form because it becomes insoluble as the temperature drops. Now, what will happen is your impurities will remain dissolved in your solution, okay? But that, that's the stuff you don't want. There's a smaller quantity of them, so it'll take a lot longer for them to crystallize out. Remember, if it's saturated with the product that you want, they will crystallize out first. So you don't want them impurities. Then what we have to do is filter, we get our solid purified crystals, and we wash it with very cold solvent. Okay, it's gotta be cold, you don't want it to dissolve. Um, you just wanna you just wanna remove any any remaining insoluble uh, soluble impurities that might be remaining there. And then we just dry it off, you can pass it between two um, uh, filter paper, two bits of filter paper, and you can dry it off through that method. But your solvent, like we say, is really, really important, okay? So what you want, okay, you want your impure solids to dissolve fully in the hot solvent but virtually, um, but it's virtually insoluble when it's cold. Okay, we don't want it to be still. We don't want it to be dissolved when it actually starts to cool off. Otherwise, it defeats the point. Okay, so we want it to actually dissolve or precipitate back out when it gets cooler. Um, so basically, we want that because if we don't get that, then we won't be able to dissolve our hot solvent. Then we can't actually filter it. Um, and the purified, we can't actually filter it in the Buckner funnel, we can't get our purified uh, crystals back um, if it's still soluble in the cold one. So basically this is really important for step two. So you can see here when it cools down, we want the crystals to start to form. If your solid product is still soluble even when it's cooled, um, you can't separate your product. So it's gonna be really important that you pick your solvent carefully. Okay, so once we've got our solid, we can test to see actually have we removed all of our impurities. Um, and basically we just measure the melting point of it. So all we do is we just add a sample of the solid product into a capillary tube. It's just a really fine glass tube. We place this into a heating element in a melting point apparatus as you can see here. Okay, so it goes into the just the top here. You just place it in and you look down this little bit here. Now what we do is you slowly increase the temperature. So we use these up and down arrows to just warm it up gradually until the substance starts to melt and you can see it through this eyepiece here. Now there is a temperature range from which the solid just starts to melt and when it fully melts. And that's what you wanna really look out for. And what we're looking for is we're gonna compare the melting point against the data book values, okay, of the substance that we think we've made, compare it. Now if your substance contains loads of impurities, the melting point will be lower, okay, than what it says in the data book, and the temperature range, which is this bit here, will be um, larger if it contains lots of impurities. If you get a really sharp temperature range, a really narrow one, that's a good sign. That means you probably don't have very many impurities in your sample. Okay, so let's look at um, an, another analytical and separation technique, which is thin layer chromatography. So thin layer chromatography, or TLC, uh, allows us to separate and identify our compounds. Now, TLC uses a stationary phase of silica or alumina, and this is mounted onto a glass or metal plate. We get a pencil line is drawn uh, along the side, and we get the drops of mixture are added onto it. And you can see here, there's our plate, there's the pencil line that's drawn across, and we have our samples that are, are dropped onto that, onto that pencil line. You can see here that we've got a, a lid, a glass lid that's placed on top of the beaker. This prevents any of your solvent evaporating. You don't want that. Your stationary phase is the bit that doesn't move. So this is silicon dioxide or aluminium oxide, which is mounted onto this glass or metal plate here. And the mobile phase is the liquid solvent that we sit the plate into, okay? And that's the bit that moves that will migrate up that stationary phase. Now, what we do, like I say, you place the plate into the solvent. The baseline, though, this bit here, must be above the solvent line. You see, there's the solvent line there, and you see it's just above that solvent line. We don't want it to be under it. So what we do is we leave, um, we leave it until the solvent has moved up uh, to near the top of the plate, which is up here, and we remove, um, and we mark the solvent and allow it to dry. So we remove this plate here, so take it out, and then we mark where the solvent front actually went up to and we just allow it to dry. So you've got to do that pretty immediately, otherwise your solvent will dry out and you won't know where it went up to. 
And basically it works by this um, solvent dissolving the, um, the spots of the chemicals that you've placed on this line here. Some of the chemicals in the mixture um, may not dissolve as much um, and they're, they're, they're not, they don't dissolve very well. And what they'll do is they'll stick to the stationary phase much more readily and probably deposit lower down on the chromatogram um, where some will dissolve pretty readily and they will stay in the solvent for quite a bit and they might just just deposit down further up here as the solvent becomes um, uh, less abundant. There's less solvent effectively as you go further up of the chromatogram. Okay, And what you're left with is you'll have loads of different spots that are shown on your chromatogram. And what we can do is we can identify uh, these chemicals by just measuring the positions of these spots in reference to the solvent line where the solvent went up to. Okay, now colourless compounds, uh, these can be used, um, or these can be seen, sorry, uh, using iodine or fluorescent dyes and UV light. Um, some, obviously, colourless compounds, you can't see them moving up this chromatogram paper. Ideal if you've got coloured compounds because you can see them, but if we don't, we have to use other techniques. So we use fluorescent dyes and UV light to this. And all we do is we add a fluorescent dye to that silica and alumina. So we, when we're mixing this up, we're ready to make our plate. We just mix in a fluorescent dye and this can be seen with a UV lamp. And basically the colorless spots on the chromatogram will block any glow from that fluorescent dye. So you'll see the rest of the plate will glow, but you'll get spots where it's not glowing. Uh, and basically we can then draw around these spots wherever they are. So you can see here, there's our, um, there's our fluorescent dye. Um, it's obviously showing up as a violet color under a UV lamp. And you can see where these spots are that are, are blocked out. And this is basically your chromatogram. We just draw circles around them and we've obviously spotted them. Now we can use iodine as well. Um, this is pretty a uh, simple one really, but we're just gonna place our chromatogram in a sealed jar so we're not getting any substance escaping with a few iodine crystals in the bottom corner. The iodine vapor will migrate through the jar with your chromatogram in there and it'll stick to the chemicals on the plate and it'll dye them purple. And so you can see here, this is like a, a little diagram showing it. So you see the iodine vapor is what we call a locating agent. So it's basically locating the spots on the chromatogram. You can see here, there's the chromatogram in there. Uh, the iodine crystals are there. The vapor comes off and it dyes the spots this violet color. Okay, so remember we're talking about measuring these spots relative to the solvent front. Um, this is called an RF value. And basically these can be identified by calculating the RF value from a chromatogram. So the number of spots on the plate tell you how many chemicals actually make up that mixture. Uh, these can be identified using an RF value, uh, and we compare these to a library of known RF values. So you can see here, we've got our chromatogram. I'm just gonna uh, point out some different things here. There's our solvent front. This is the line at which the solvent has migrated up to. This is the baseline. This is where we started our chemicals. Um, we've just isolated and just looked at one spot for this example, but this is just showing the distance traveled by one spot on the chromatogram, and this is the distance traveled by the um, solvent. Now these two colored lines are crucial in working out the RF value. And this is why, because RF can be calculated by taking the distance traveled by the spot, that's the one in red, divided by the distance traveled by the solvent, which is the one in purple. And basically the RF values are fixed for each chemical. Okay, so it doesn't matter what the chemical is, um, it's always fixed. However, this will change if the temperature, the solvent, or the makeup of this TLC plate changes. Okay, so the, the RF value is only true in very certain conditions. Okay, another form of chromatography is something called column chromatography. And this is ideal for separating and purifying larger quantities of a mixture. Okay, so this is a much bigger scale version. So TLC, like we've just seen, is useful for separating tiny quantities, little spots of it. It can't be used for larger substances though, but column chromatography is used. So basically what we have is a burette or another glass column, normally it is just, um, just a burette. We pack it full of silica or alumina that's packed full inside here. That is the stationary phase, a bit like in TLC, so it's the same thing. We've just arranged it slightly differently. And basically what we do is we pour the, um, uh, the mixture and the solvent, and the solvent is the mobile phase that's moving through the column. This is run through the column, but the solvent has to be run through continuously. So we've got to keep pouring this solvent in at the top 
and running it all the way through. Now, what happens is we get these different compounds that we've added in our mixture. When these run through the column, they move through at different rates. So some will take longer to get through the column than others. And what we do, what we effectively have done, is we start to separate these bands out. And we get them coming out at different times. You can see here that we've got a band here coming out pretty quickly. This band's taking a little bit longer. And this substance here is obviously taking much longer. It's spending more time... Um, sticking to the stationary phase than it is moving through this mobile phase. But as you can see here, because we can see these bands coming through, we can separate them. We can collect this band in one beaker and then get another beaker next, collect that band in the next beaker and collect that one in the, in the beaker after that. So it's pretty useful. But as we've separated the chemicals, we actually have pure chemicals because whereas before we had these three mixed together, now we've separated them, we have more purified form. Okay, so let's look at um, how we can, obviously we've separated our chemicals, that's pretty useful. We can use chromatography to do that. But now we can say, right, well, let's see if we can try and identify what these individual chemicals are. And one of the ways in which we can do that is through using infrared spectroscopy. Now, IR, or infrared spectroscopy, uses infrared radiation to increase that vibrational energy of the covalent bonds in your sample that you've just made. And basically, the frequency of the infrared radiation absorbed by that covalent bond depends on the atoms that are either side of that bond and the position of the bond in the molecule. Um, so for example, you might have an OH and an alcohol um, will um, vibrate at a different frequency to an OH and a carboxylic acid. Now you can see here that you will get a data sheet and the data, uh, or you'll be given this data in the exam, and this is just showing your wave number for different bonds in a, in a substance. Now, what I've got here is an infrared spectrum, and this infrared spectrum is of ethanoic acid. And what we're going to do is just assign these peaks to, um, to justify that it is ethanoic acid. So you can see we've got this big broad peak here. Now, broad peaks tell us we've got an OH group. Now, um, you can see this is at about 3,000 centimetres, or per centimetre. So this is telling us that this is an OH for an acid rather than for an alcohol, which would be a little bit further up the spectrum. So this is telling us it's an OH group from an acid. We've also got this peak here, and this peak is basically the C double bond O um, signal. This is about 1700, um, and this is obviously telling us that we have a carbonyl group in there, 1680 to 1750. So the carbonyl group and the OH from the acid tells us that this is going to be a carboxylic acid. Now, Infrared spectrum is fine because it tells us obviously the functional groups that are there, but it's it's pretty difficult for us to identify just from these peaks here that this is definitely ethanoic acid. So we have to use another technique. Um, and we'll look at that technique in a minute, but just uh, looking at this first, um, what it can do is actually if we can um, uh, oxidize, uh, say like if it was an alcohol, you'd have an OH alcohol peak just further up here. If we oxidize that, then what should happen is that peak should disappear um, because obviously um, if we form an aldehyde, it doesn't have an OH group in there. Um, that will disappear and we just have our carbonyl group, um, obviously because it doesn't have an OH group. So we can actually use the infrared basically to just confirm that it could be an alcohol just by reacting it and rerunning it through your infrared. Okay, so like I say, just going back to that bit there, um, where we have our um, uh, infrared is, is, is quite limited to identifying functional group. Mass spectrometry can help us to identify the compound. And um, when we use them both in conjunction to both, just as good, to be honest. So mass spectrometry is used to find the relative molecular mass of a compound, or the MR. Okay, now... Just to kind of talk you through the different parts of this, we've got an MZ on the bottom, and this is the mass to charge of a fragment. Uh, most fragments, when we put them through a mass spectrometer, they do have a charge of plus one. So this is basically just the same as the fragment mass. Um, so for example, this has got a fragment mass of 50, an MZ of 50. Um, now this could be a, a molecule with a mass of 50 with a charge of one. So 50 divided by one just gives you 50. Um, this is um, this peak here, um, or these peaks on the graph, these show fragments of the original molecule that was being broken up. But the last peak is the M plus peak, um, and this is the molecular iron peak. Um, and basically, this is the same as the relative molecular mass of the molecule. 
Um, sometimes we can get what we call an M plus one peak, that just a tiny peak that sits one above the M plus peak. Um, that is basically just a molecule with an isotope in there. So for example, um, you can have, um, like I work with one isotope that's heavier than the rest, so to say. So a classic example is carbon. So you might have a, uh, an organic molecule um, and it will have, um, um, let's say it's got three carbons in and all three carbons are carbon 12 because that's the most abundant isotope. But you might get a molecule with a, uh, a carbon 13 atom. Now, what that's going to do is it's just going to increase your molecule by a mass of one and that's going to show up as a tiny little peak just after here and that's called an M plus one peak because that's a, a, a molecule with an isotope that's slightly heavier than the rest of them just to make you aware of that. Right, so let's have a look at fragmentation then. Um, so molecules, when we put these to a mass spectrometer, they break up when they're bombarded with these high energy electrons and we call this fragmentation. And basically this can be used to determine the molecular structure, so it's quite powerful. So let's have a look at some propane fragments. Um, fragmentation produces positive fragment and a radical and only the positive fragment will actually go through the mass spectrometer and is actually detected. So the molecular iron peak is produced in the spectrum is going to be this. So basically this is the unfragmented molecule. Sometimes not all molecules are broken up and fragmented, so we get the whole lot going through. And you can see here that's the that's the peak there. Now this for this particular molecule will produce three major peaks. So what will produce is obviously this one here. This is your um, molecular iron peak. But we'll also get it fragment at this point here. And it fragments where the carbon-carbon is because that's the weakest part. So it'll fragment either to form CH3, CH2 dot and CH3 plus. Or it can fragment to form a CH3, CH2 plus or a CH3 dot radical. But the only bits that will actually go through are the ones circled in red. The radicals won't go through the mass spectrometer so aren't detected. So the mass spectrometer will detect these three major peaks here. Okay, so it's this one here, which would be the molecular ion, and these two fragments here. Now, if we have a look at our mass spectrum, this is what it would look like. You can see here we've got our molecular ion, which is this one. This is the full molecule. We'll get a peak at 29, which is the CH3, CH2 fragment, and the CH3 fragment, uh, CH3 plus fragment, comes in at 15. So we should get three major peaks that should look something like that. Now, You'd see we've got some smaller peaks. We might have some other tiny peaks here, but we've just omitted them just to make it a little bit easier to see. But um, apart from this one, uh, look out for um, specific numbers because these tell you these could tell you about a particular fragment. So, for example, look out for peaks at 17. These could be an OH plus. Obviously, like in this one, peaks at 15 suggest methyl uh, um, cations, so CH3 uh, plus. And uh, look out for carbonyl groups, C double bond O plus. Uh, these would give peaks at 28. So just look out for some of these peaks and just be aware of what they could represent. Okay, so um, like I say, obviously we're going to look at um, uh, fragmentation patterns and they can actually be used to identify molecules with the same constituent atoms, so the same makeup. And this is because uh, they produce different fragments. So let's just have a look at an example. So we've got propanol and propanone. Now, both of these actually have um, the same number of atoms and the same types of atoms in here. So it's really difficult to distinguish them um, um, normally. But obviously, we can use a mass spectrometer and fragmentation to identify them. So some of the major peaks of propanol, for example, are this, which is the molecular iron peak, 58. We can get it broken there. We can break it and form CH3 and CH2+. Plus. And obviously we can break it in the same place and form the COH group. And we get these different peaks here. If we look at the propanone fragment though, propanone can break in different ways. Obviously we've got our molecular iron peak, which is going to be the same as the top. But we can break it here and we can form a CH3CO, which would be a peak at 43. And uh, we can break and form CH3+, plus which is this fragment here. Now, mainly this fragment is going to be quite unique to this molecule because we can't really create that fragment from this one. So a peak at 43 will tell you that this could be a propanone um, molecule. So as you can see, look at the different fragments and we can distinguish between these two chemicals. So we can even identify our unknown compound as well. If we compare the spectrum that we produce, the full spectrum, against the library of known spectra, then we could potentially identify the molecule that we've actually formed. 
Now, obviously we don't use these in isolation. We use both of these spectral techniques in conjunction with each other. Um, and basically it helps us to identify our unknown compound and we use both mass spectrometry and infrared. So the first thing we need to do really is to use the um, infrared spectroscopy and what that will do is allow us to identify any functional groups in our unknown sample. And then once we've identified our functional groups, we then use mass spectrometry and that basically allows us to identify the structure of our molecule and the mass of our molecule and that's used from fragmentation patterns. Okay, so let's have a look at a bit of green chemistry um, just to kind of round this off really. So green chemistry is just a way in which resources are used sustainably by protecting the Earth's resources and the environment. So basically we're going to try and look for um, alternatives to crude oil. So for example, um, using um, alternatives uh, to the manufacture of plastics using crude oil. So plant material we can use instead to make certain plastics because they're renewable, so that's better. Using less energy, so reducing the amount of energy we use or using more energy efficient technology um, to reduce our energy consumption when making some of these products. Uh, using renewable energy, so um, using things like solar, wind, bioethanol. This will reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, which are obviously running scarce uh, and they're non-renewable. Um, toxicity is quite important actually this one uh, using chemicals that are non-toxic and a lot more sustainable um, obviously for humans for us using them but also um, we don't want to produce uh, byproducts which are toxic because they we have to dispose of them and that could cause harm to the environment safety obviously we're using chemicals that, and techniques that reduce the risk of explosion and fire i suppose that's quite self-explanatory um, technology monitoring the use of chemicals to reduce the risk um, um, using the technology to monitor, for example, pollution that's been put into the atmosphere or monitoring a reaction um, is a lot more sustainable than just doing the reaction and just hoping for the best. So it's a lot better being informed using technology. Um, atom economy, using high atom economy reactions reduces waste. We're using more atoms to produce the product. So um, industry will always try to strive towards 100% atom economy. Uh, catalysts, obviously these reduce the energy needed for that reaction. So using catalysts allows you to um, uh, or use a reaction much more efficiently. Um, and end of use. So once you've made the product and it's been used, what do we do with it at the end? So creating products that are more biodegradable is a lot more, um, is a lot more sustainable. Um, it's not just about making these, it's about what we do with them in the end as well. Uh, or even if we can make them using um, recyclable materials, um, then we can reuse the material that was used and or you can even repurpose it and make it into something completely different. So that is a lot more sustainable doing that. Okay, and that's basically it as a summary for practical and analytical techniques for the Salters course. Um, please show your support for the channel and just subscribe to the channel. All of these are free, completely free. Um, and you know it's there to, to help you so all the need in return is just to subscribe to the channel really it's dead easy and um, so if you just click on that little circle in the middle there uh, you'll be able to subscribe also just a reminder these slides are available to purchase um, if you just click on the link in the description box great value for money great to enhance your revision but that's it bye bye